Jesa is a Confucian tradition that Koreans, modern Koreans, have inherited from Joseon Dynasty. Uh, it is a uh, death ritual for the deceased, as well as you know for the commemoration of the dead. Uh, on the days of New Year's celebration, as well as uh, Harvest Moon Festival, we also conduct something similar. They call it chare, but in essence, it is the same kind of practice, where uh, families gather, they clean the house inside and out, and prepare fine foods for the cer ceremony. And during the ceremony, we would do a repeated bowing and recite a prayer and, you know, pray for the souls of the dead. Uh, in contemporary uh, South Korean society, jazz has rather become uh, controversial because of its patriarchal nature. Uh, women do most of the work, uh, only to be excluded in the actual uh, ceremony. Uh, women would uh, just sit or stand by, you know, by the side and watch uh, the man conduct the ritual. So in, nowadays, some people, uh, some women, in fact, mothers, uh, would participate in public protest, uh, asking their uh, future generations to stop doing this, uh, what is considered outmoded, uh, you know, practice, a patriarchal practice, that is. Uh, for me, it was, uh, at personal level, uh, an important occasion, uh, a respite from the violent society that I was growing, growing up in during the 1970s and 80s, where the military government uh, and their practice of oppression was pervasive throughout the society so that, you know, within schools, playgrounds, everywhere, violence was a norm. And for me, as a young child, uh, these moments of Jesa, especially the silent moments, provided me with uh, moments of uh, break from, you know, those horrific and traumatic experiences in the everyday life. So that is my personal uh, take on Jesa to some extent. Yeah. I began this series of Jesa paintings about 10 years ago. As I mentioned just now, uh, I believe it was one of the most earliest and most profound experience for me as a child. Uh, watching my father, my late father, performing Jesa, you know, he was, it was clear to me that he was intending to demonstrate how Jesa is supposed to be conducted. And he was rather very solemn, all dressed up in Western suit. And, you know, he would uh, in some way subtly brag about his ability to memorize some 20 minute long prayer uh, while, you know, leading this, you know, ritual. And we were sort of forced to, my brothers, that is, my brothers and I were forced to follow along and, you know, sort of, there's a kind of give and take response to these prayers that he, he would lead. And I suppose there was a kind of unwritten or unspoken expectation, perhaps, that this ritual continues uh, after his passing, although he has never said that in his life. Um, anyhow, I think that solemnity, the seriousness of the occasion, brought me very clearly that this is very different kinds of experience than everyday life experience. And I think the way it was imposed on me, I think I got it very clear, I got the message very clear that uh, death is very much part of life, all on, maybe as early as I can remember when I was about five or so that this is a continuation or part of life, and that uh, this fear of death, perhaps, you know, even though I couldn't articulate at the time or even recognize it clearly, perhaps, uh, that death is impending uh, upon us, upon every, everyone. Uh, this fear of death drive might perhaps be the kind of primary motif or, or motivation uh, behind my work when I recognized that I was you know, engaged in this practice, 
this is something really profound, something greater than what I am, who I am, uh, but something that uh, art is about. You know, if you look at uh, collections of art objects at the Metropolitan Museum, for example, uh, these objects were part of daily rituals in other countries and other cultures and societies. And once when they were selected and brought into a museum and designated as art, we see them, we regard them as art. But in fact, this important art was very much part of life and about death. And I thought this was something that not many people have considered as a legitimate subject of art. Uh, and I wanted to embrace that uh, because this was very much an important part of my upbringing. All of these paintings were based on my experience of witnessing Dostoevsky in person in Korea. When my family immigrated to North America, first in Canada initially, uh, and while my father was alive, uh, you know, we did continue to Jessa. Uh, I do recall some of the scenery has changed because uh, we were suddenly living in North America, so there is a certain, uh, f you know, fruits that were available in North America, you know, started to appear uh, on the tables. Uh, but then the, the landscape, or I mean the, the, the domestic scene in which the Jesa takes place would change because, you know, it was no longer in Korean homes, but rather Western homes. Um, after my father passed away, we did continue, but as my mother got older, uh, I think the, f the degree or the extent to which the food was prepared became somewhat uh, not casual, but uh, not as extensive, perhaps, you know, because these dishes prepare a huge amount of efforts to prepare. Uh, my mother is still alive, but, you know, we encourage her to go easy, you know, uh, and also, uh, you know, sisters-in-law would try to help her. Um, after I married and formed my own nuclear family, I have never dared to ask my wife to prepare Jessa to remember my side of family only, right? Uh, perhaps ideally, um, it might be uh, worthwhile to, for me to try to cook for, for Jessa, for my parents, or my ancestors, or even my wife's, you know, family. Um, but that's something I have not tried yet. And maybe painting these images might be an excuse to postpone that uh, uh, revisionist attempt at Jessa. Earlier I alluded to my father's uh, demonstration of ritual. Uh, and my father and mother are devout Catholics. And as I was growing up, I have seen on many occasions my parents associating with priests, nuns, and bishops of Catholic Church in Korea. And some, many of them frequented our house. Uh, in 1984, uh, Pope John Paul II visited Korea to consecrate 103 Korean saints. I suppose most people do not know the fact that there are more than 100 Korean saints uh, after whom they could name themselves. That fact, uh, you know, indicates the extent to which uh, Korean Catholicism was deeply, uh, uh, you know, involved with the tradition of Jesa. I mean, what I mean to say is that uh, these saints were executed. In fact, they were beheaded because of their refusal to renounce their faith in Catholicism in 19th century. Um, so Pope came to honor their, you know, uh, their lives. Uh, it's an aside, but it, an interesting fact. Uh, you know, in my mother's house in Toronto, there is a sofa set on which the, that Pope has sat, and my father brought it home. Uh, and you know, also a three-foot-tall statue at, of Virgin Mary on which the Pope has signed. 
and that object is you know included in this I mean the photographic you know representation of that object is included in this exhibition. My father uh, read this uh, particular form of Catholic prayer that is very cryptic if you actually look at it. I mean earlier when I was a child I didn't really understand it but uh, it is you know written in and spoken in this archaic Korean language. Uh, the, the ways in which words are addressed uh, are not often used these days. Uh, but some of the pronouns, like names of saints, they refer to, you know, Western Catholic saints like John Paul II, or you know, uh, you know, saints like Paul and Peter and John and so on and so forth, as well as female saints, and names of places like uh, Israel and Jerusalem and so on. So these are these foreign-sounding names are mixed with, you know, archaic Korean language. And this is a very hybrid uh, product of the bygone era that we continue to practice. And, and I re recognize that even Jeza, at least the way it was practiced in our house, as well as in, uh, I, I presume many Catholic families, are, they're actually really practicing a very hybrid cultural form. So it's, it's not purely Catholic, it's not purely Confucian, but combination of both. You know, if you look at some of the iconography in Ca Korean Catholic Church, you would, you'd find some interesting examples like uh, paintings that depict uh, this uh, moment of holiness, you know, except, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm referring to paintings that is based on Renaissance painting, where Jesus is in the center and there are saints surrounding him and there are angels flying around above his head. Except in Korean version, you might see this Korean saint in the middle, and then there are other lesser known saints around them, and so on. And there is a kind of mythological figures floating in the sky wearing Korean traditional hanbok. You know, so these are another kind of example of hybrid nature of uh, acculturation of Catholicism in Korean context. One of the paintings in the exhibition actually has an example. Uh, this person, the head of the family, is a radiologist, meaning that he believes in science, but also he is a devout Catholic, so he chose to put a crucifix in, you know, in the middle of the Jesa table, uh, while ignoring this traditional or, you know, rule of arranging certain types of foods. You know, there's a fine sort of disregard towards that, but he insists on putting the crucifix in the bottle of wine. Of course, uh, as a child, um, I, I was maybe led to believe these doctrines of Catholicism, as well as to follow blindly uh, the rituals. Uh, now, uh, you know, after I grew up, uh, I stopped going to church. I recognized that I was not so much interested in the doctrines or theologies of the church. Uh, I suppose I'm more interested in East Asian ways of life uh, or ways of looking at the world. Um, I am more interested in the form of rituals than the religions per se. Um, I think, you know, when you, when you pray, you know, you bring your hands together uh, in order to bring your mind to focus. I think that uh, it is mind that follows the body. Like by making certain gesture, you f are uh, following that gesture. Your mind is led by the gesture. So it is the body that leads the mind rather than the other way around. And I think I'm, I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by the ways in which an individual becomes part of the community when in a uh, religious context or spiritual context. Uh, a Korean-born uh, philosopher based in Germany, Byung Chul Han, talks about how in religion um, you, f you become part of a community without necessarily communicating. And I think that's exactly what I experienced during Jessa. You know, during moments of silence, you know, I would be sitting there or standing there or bowing my head to the floor. 
uh, without saying anything, but I'm implicated by that gesture that is shared by everybody. And we're not saying anything, but I'm part of that community. And this is in direct contrast to uh, the ways in which our contemporary culture, there's so much communication through SNS, but there's no community. At best, maybe there's an echo chamber. Uh, I think that uh, what religion offers me is that moment of silence, you know, during which I hesitate, you know, like, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, so I look to the el elders for their le leadership. Uh, and I think it's through that uh, uh, hesitancy that I discover how to move on, how to continue. And I think that is the essence of the ritual that is collectively shared, as well as uh, an essence of the tradition. Tradition can mean so many different things, and everyone has different kinds of relationship to traditions. Many people, I believe, have fraught relationship with tradition. Uh, in the Korean context, uh, perhaps unlike many other you know, countries that are not part of the West, uh, tradition has become a dilemma, I think. Uh, tradition is a modern invention, if you will. Uh, when the, the non-West encountered the West, they had to identify, establish their identity. Uh, and I think that created the sense of tradition. What they've been doing every day on a continuous basis has become a tradition which they had to overcome in order to westernize or modernize. Uh, so that uh, if you look at Korean history, tradition such as the subject of the uh, paintings in this show or shamanism, for example, you know, these were cons considered obstructions to progress. Uh, so tradition became an, an a kind of you know, polar opposite of progress, rationalism, and you know, moving forward. Uh, and tradition is to be shunned or to be even scorned at, uh, something to be you know, brushed off or something. Um, and you know, ironically, uh, the military regime in South Korea in the 70s tried to you know, abolish this kind of you know, traditional uh, religious practices, while at the same time they selectively embrace the patriarchal nature of this tradition called Confucianism in this context. So, I mean, that just, you know, is a small example of how fraught tradition means to, you know, many people. Uh, for diasporic Asian or Korean like myself, uh, tradition is something like an object of longing in some ways. And also, as an artist, if I deal with this motif of tradition, this becomes a kind of double-edged sword against me. You know, when I was a student, when I make an abstract painting, a professor would say, why don't you make something about Korea? You know, your Korean culture, right? Where's Koreanness in your art? And if I do that, then they, they will also say, well, you're exoticizing yourself. It's a no-win situation. Uh, I'm glad this is, should be a thing of the past. Maybe it isn't fully, but uh, I like to think that we have come some way along where I can make works like this and claim that this is my genuine experience, even if it's a hybrid experience, hybrid cultural experience. So earlier I talked about hesitation, you know, during these rituals because I didn't, I didn't know because I was a child. Uh, if tradition is something that should not be an object to overcome. Uh, you know, I would say, you know, it is in those moments of pause that you can find continuity, the potential of continuity. Uh, I think, you know, making paintings or the moments of silence in, in this jazz ritual, I think those, you know, provide me these moments of pause and silence and in them that I see how I might be able to con continue tradition without having to defend myself. 
repetition is uh, a very important and integral part of this practice. When I teach painting, I often ask students, like, why are you wanting to paint today? Why do you want to learn paint, to paint today? When we are, you know, surrounded by these media images and savvy, you know, uh, amazing technological tools. Um, I think the essence of painting is the fact that it's static. It doesn't change. That's what I'm interested in, and that's why I'm attracted to painting even today. Uh, I think, the, I mean, of course, there are amazing, fantastic uh, works of art that is done in moving images. I'm a, I'm a great lover of you know, films, uh, among other things. But uh, most often, the visual culture that we consume on a daily basis has to do with profit more than anything else. Um, and you know we are also not only the subject I mean I mean consumers but also subject to uh, sort of compelled and compelled to produce sort of authentic self through SNS and so on um, and I, I want to resist that you know I think painting is an, is a you know in that sense a moral act to resist that kind of you know pervasive trend in which image is no longer stable and I think painting stabilizes an image, an idea uh, that we can sit with. And I think the objects that I regard during the moments of Jeza has that kind of presence that is much more stronger and powerful than uh, what a smartphone can do. The title, share, The Share for Those Who Remain, uh, refers to sort of complex feelings uh, about um, what to do with things that you inherit after someone passes. I think, um, you know, people probably somewhat older would recognize when somebody, when grandparents pass away or when your parents pass away, you inherit all these clothes and, you know, uh, books and, you know, the papers, letters, you know, or personal effects, right? Items that were dear to him or them or not, you know? What do you do with them? How do you dispose of them? Do you throw them out or do you donate them or do you keep them the way parents keep their children's clothing as treasures? Uh, there's a certain moment of uh, hesitations and, you know, a certain decision has to be made ultimately. And this, uh, this could be, be a burden on, on the person. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, maybe there are other ways to think about that. Um, in my context, in the context of this exhibition, I'm referring to the legacy of a person, whether the person uh, had a positive or negative impact, whether that legacy was uh, influential or not. You know, how do you make of, what do you make of the person's passing? Um, yeah, and, and you, know, you know, we all have complex relationships with our, you know, predecessors. Uh, any viewer could take away with anything uh, they're prone to, uh, but there are a few things, uh, several things I like them to recognize, hopefully. Uh, perhaps uh, to begin with, maybe when they encounter an artist who's committed to painting uh, a death ritual, maybe it might dawn on them that um, that death is part of life, and that uh, what is visual is not everything. Uh, I mean, the reason why you know we create this beautiful display of food is to sort of entice, you know, attract the spirits the ghosts, you know, they create these complex patterns that they might recognize in some way, in that way, it's like an antenna, or, you know. Uh, they are at the kind of threshold or liminal space where ghosts might inhabit. That's why you create this amazing display. I hope the viewers would recognize that these works are about loss. Uh, there's an absence of pe people. 
both people who are commemorating as well as people who are the subject of remembrance. Um, even though the focus is on the table and the foods and so on, it is the people who made them possible. And over the years, as I engage with my own photographs of these rituals, the people who are participating in the preparation of these tables start to disappear one by one. Um, so again, I recognize that, you know, this is our life. And I want to not only mourn them, but also celebrate them. I intend to honor the labor of Korean women. Uh, all the women who, behind the scenes, in the kitchen, uh, preparing all these amazing foods for the community to share. Um, in some way, perhaps uh, this work is perhaps my longing to belong to that community. But as a diaspora Korean, it is oftentimes difficult to access. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to honor, including my mother, you know, these numerous, countless Korean women who have been uh, devoting their time and efforts and their minds and their thoughts to uh, honor their, you know, uh, partners, families, tradition. Uh, I do want to point out that by painting this jesa, which is patriarchal tradition, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, I'm sort of conservative holdover or that I'm a, cons yeah, you know, patriarchal, you know, uh, holdout. Uh, images are complex and ambiguous by nature. You know, if I paint an image of a gun, it doesn't mean I'm automatically a gun lover or anti-gun. Images are very complex. So when I paint this jesa, similarly, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm, you know, trying to hold on to the legacy of Jesa per se. Uh, yeah. And so I hope my work uh, embodies these complex layers of uh, meanings and references.